Well, good evening, everyone. I know there may be a few other folks that will be signing in as we progress, but uh, again, thank you all for joining us this evening, Tuesday, October 4th. And as I mentioned, I hope everybody has had a, a good fall so far. I know it's it seemed like summer just immediately turned to fall, but um, I think we'll get a nice Indian summer here in the next couple weeks and maybe the fall colors will really pop at that time too. So um, this evening, oh, by the way, my name is Nancy Howell. I'm on the board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon and we've got our wonderful uh, speaker series going on. And tonight we will be hearing uh, about uh, trumpeter swans, but we've got a few announcements to make beforehand. And of course, I'd like to welcome everyone as usual. And uh, also um, just, oops, come back here. Just to mention the monthly speaker series and we have field trips going on. So again, check our website out, try to attend some of our, our bird walks and field trips, the second Saturday bird walks which will be discussed a little bit later on. We've got bird walks in Tremont. We've got some, at least another evening bird walk going on. And we have some other things coming up too, like the Christmas bird count. And the Christmas bird count is going to be taking place on, oops, come back here, on Friday, December 30th. Now, if somebody's gonna be like, ah, oh, it's a Friday. Well, the, with the holidays on the weekends, you know, the Christmas and then the New Year's holidays on weekends, um, we have done weekday Christmas bird counts before. And uh, we'll have a lot more information about the count. It'll go out in, uh, in our next newsletter. And uh, we'll also have a, a pre-Christmas count event. And that's what our next slide is. So we're going to have a virtual pre-Christmas bird count, uh, kind of a rah-rah, get everybody excited about going out. And that'll be on uh, Monday, December 12th at 7. And then, of course, the count today will be Friday, December 30th. And we may, now this is tentative, notice in red, it says tentative, we may be able to have our dinner in person at the Rocky River Nature Center on that evening. Um, we'll we provide the food and people bring in some desserts and stuff. Um, but right now, I don't know, um, you know if we're going to be able to be at the Nature Center that's still in the work. So more information uh, will be coming out later. And uh, as far as our e-newsletter, uh, some of you may receive this. Um, it comes out once a week, uh, generally on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And you can sign up for it at our website or take a look at the, at the link there. Um, it arrives weekly through MailChimp. And what it does is it um, reiterates some of the things that we uh, have going on and kind of ups, updates you on uh, events coming up, the speaker series. Sometimes we get something really quickly in our email and we want to get it out to everybody. So again, it's once a week through MailChimp, you sign up for it. If you say, oh man, I'm just getting way too many of these. I can't keep up with it. You can always unsubscribe at any time. We hope you don't but it's just really a good way to keep up with things that are sometimes changing very quickly. And one of the things that did come up very quickly um, was I just got this uh, email today in our info at WC Audubon. Um, the, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to have a webinar on bird window collisions. And um, so you can, and you, I'm sure you can see the time is at two to three on October 6th, which is Thursday. I'm, I'm sure that's convenient for everybody, right? Um, but uh, it looks really, really interesting because, oops, come back here. Come back here. 
because um, it, the speaker uh, is going to talk about a lot of things, um, as you can see from the write up, key oh, research advances, funny. how bird window collisions vary in time, seasonally, and throughout the day and night, um, bird, you know, with bird migration, with weather systems. Um, so there's just a lot that's going to be covered. So registration, you can see the link down below. Uh, we'll try to get that into our, our um, chat so that folks might be able to join in. But again, like I say, this is probably the worst slide ever because I just kind of threw it together from the information they provided. Um, but uh, you know, if you can, and you're interested in, again, bird window collisions and how to uh, hopefully uh, stop them or reduce those, um, this might be something that you'd be interested in. All right, Michelle, one of our board members and our field trip co-coordinator. Michelle, how are you? I'm great, thanks, Nancy. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to cover our bird walks and um, how you can connect with us on social media. Oh, and Nancy, you might need to get rid of that pop up at the bottom again. We're oh, missing yeah. part of the slide. All right, thank you. All right, next slide, please. All right, so please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walks. Uh, the next one is October 8th at 9 a.m. Uh, that's this coming Saturday at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. Uh, last year in October, we saw 15 yellow rumped warblers, <clears throat> excuse me, several flocks of American goldfinch, a yellow bellied sapsucker, and a bald eagle. So please join us this Saturday to see um, what we will have this October. All right, next slide, please. This past second Saturday was held on September 10th. And here is Bill Dininger's report. He says the second Saturday of the September 2022 started with temperatures at 70 degrees and ended at 79 degrees. 24 observers tallied 42 species. Most of the expected species were seen. Seven warbler species were sighted. There were a large number of American goldfinch sighted. Highlights were seven rose-breasted grosbeak and nine ruby-throated hummingbirds. And then I also snapped a photo of that red-eyed vireo um, picture there on the screen on that walk as well. All right, next slide, please. Our early evening bird walks take place the third Wednesday of every month through October. So please note the time change. As we get later into the year, we start meeting at 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. So this month, the group is meeting at Cleveland Metro Park's Lagoon Picnic Area. And this is the last early evening walk of uh, 2022. And Nancy Howell is our leader for the walk. So um, hope to see you on October 19th. Next slide, please. All right, please also join us the fourth Saturday of every month for the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walks. Uh, we are running these walks through November this year. We meet at the Cleveland Metro Parks parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of Sokolowski's University Inn. Uh, from there, your bird walk leaders, Nancy Howell and Al Rand, will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. Uh, the next walk is Saturday, October 22nd at 9 a.m. Um, so we hope to see you there. All right, next slide, please. All right, uh, please stay connected with us between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. And we have a lot of just lovely photos of birds on our Instagram page. So even if you're not a photographer, but you just wanna see pictures of lovely birds, uh, please follow us and um, and you can see all those wonderful pictures. Um, so also many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and can be found at WC Audubon YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. 
All right, and that's it for me, I believe. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Michelle. But I do want people to look at this photograph. I think it's <laughs> really fun. I think I think we need some captions to go with this. <laughs> with that yellow jacket sneaking up on the house finch, or I don't know. I, I think it's a. Did you, I'm sure you, Michelle, you knew that 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 yellow jacket was going to be there, right? And I hadn't, you're yeah, right. Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> I know I you're being sarcastic. Great. It's yeah, fantastic. I, that was a happy, a happy mistake when I when I got my my photos pulled up and, and saw that was there. So yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, we have our book discussion series, and Drina Nemes runs our book discussions. And she's here as well, and she's going to be talking about the next set of books that we're going to be going through for the 22-23 season. So, Drina, how are you? I am fine. And uh, Michelle, those pictures are just stunning. And I never appreciated, I guess, the eye ring of the yellow wump, rumped warbler, but that picture just had it in such a uh, focus that now I think it's made an impression on me and I well, may you. remember it. Thank you so much, Trina. Yes, this is our third season for our book series and we have a, a great lineup thanks to contribution of ideas from our, our members here. And um, our themes this year are quite timely, climate change, migration, adaptation, and then kind of a uh, interesting and fun a misunderstood species. Next slide, please. We meet the third Tuesdays quarterly. Uh, so just two weeks from tonight, October 18th, we'll have our first discussion. And then January 17th, and then April 18th. Next slide, please. And here's the selection. Uh, hurricane lizards and plastic squid will be what we talk about in two weeks. And then uh, Pigeon Watching by Rosemary Moscow in January, and then uh, uh, the wonderful writer Scott Widensall for A World on the Wing about migration. Next slide, please. There are so many opportunities if you're interested in uh, reading and hearing book club discussions. So Environment of the Americas Book Club has an, uh, an outstanding series usually the fourth Thursday of the month. And coming up October 27th, they'll be featuring the author. They, they always have the author there too, Paul Bogard with his book, End of Night, which uh, has a, a deep look at uh, the night sky and how we just don't see the night sky the way it is. Um, so the, um, the website for the Environment of the Americas Book Club is listed there www.migratorybirdday.org slash bird dash book dash club slash. And next slide, please. And then another wonderful uh, series is our friend David Lindo and uh, the Urban Birder. And their series starts this Thursday. He has five presentations uh, scheduled for October. So uh, the website is the urbanbirderworld.com slash live dash webinars. And his series is called In Conservation With, uh, and it's a series of Zoom interviews with leading figures. Um, just one thing to remember is that this is in England. They're five hours ahead. So when you sign up for a uh, a session if you sign up uh, and it's at eight o'clock, that's eight o'clock their time or 2 p.m. our time. So thank you very much. Hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Drina. Yeah, I hope uh, folks will be able to uh, join our book discussion, uh, grab the book from a library, the uh, uh, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid and uh, read it do a real quick read, but you know what? You don't even have to read the book. Isn't that right, Drina? Yes, I'm glad you um, are bringing that up because they uh, you can find him on YouTube. 
under Thor Hansen, the okay. author. There, there are at least two good, really good sessions about him and his book. Okay, great. Thanks. Oh, me again. How about that? We always have some fundraisers going on, and one of our fundraisers is uh, Mitchell's Homemade Ice Cream Gift Cards. They are $10 denominations, um, and you can get go to the store and get ice cream, frozen yogurt, um, vegan ice cream, uh, sorbet. There's lots of different kinds. So there's, um, again, just uh, go to our website, go to the store, purchase them. And then we, depending on how far you live, we can either hand deliver them or drop them in the mail to you. And of course, hmm, this could potentially make a nice little Halloween gift. Uh, remember the holidays are coming up as well too. So, so think about it. Ice cream is good any time of the year, right everybody? Yeah. And our coffee coordinator, Amanda, wasn't able to be here this evening, but I'm going to step in for her. Uh, Amanda does our uh, birds and beans uh, coffee, and she is going to be ordering on October 10th or by October 10th. So get your orders in, please. Uh, once the orders are in, um, she sends the order to the birds and beans folks. They fresh roast the beans, they grind them, and then get them to us generally within about a week. And then you don't even have to come and pick them up. We will deliver them to you. Or if you want a meeting place to pick up the, the coffee, that would be fine too. Um, so again, go to the website. You can see there with uh, wcaudubon.org, Bird Friendly Coffee Club, and order the type of coffees you would like. Um, and remember again, I'm going to talk about the holidays. These coffees make a great gift. So think about the holidays, whether it's uh, Christmas or New Year's or Hanukkah. Um, it makes a great gift. So again, consider that. And the, the coffee is um, helps small farms down in Central and South America. Uh, it is shade grown, which means the trees above the canopy is left there with the understory being uh, the coffee plants and so that provides habitat for the our birds our birds really the birds that spend most of the time down in central or south america but um, the it provides habitat the wintering habitat for the birds that are migrating down there right now Uh, I want to mention our program for next month. It is uh, one of our other board members, Marianne Romito, who is also our Climate Watch Coordinator for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And uh, it is all about the birds. Um, so this is going to be a very, very interesting presentation that we hope that all of you can become involved with by uh, observing, uh, taking some count points, observing a, uh, a bird or looking for birds or listening for birds uh, on a particular day in the winter. And then we'll also do one in the summer. Um, and this is going to be a long term thing uh, where we are going to see, we meaning National Audubon is going to see, will birds ranges change as the climate and habitats change. So we hope that you'll join us on Tuesday, November 1st uh, for learning all about how to volunteer for Climate Watch. And this evening, I know we're all waiting for this, uh, we'll be following uh, uh, Dr. Laura Kearns with Tracking Trumpeter Swans. And Laura works for the Ohio Division of Natural Resources, the Division of Wildlife. And as you can see from the notations here, she's been a wildlife uh, biologist with the Olentangy Research Station in Columbus. And it says for the past seven years, now this might have been a little older, might be eight years now, maybe uh, Laura will, will correct me. Um, oversees monitoring and research and management of forest and wetland birds of greater conservation need. 
Um, so bald eagles, peregrine falcons, trumpeter swans, sandhill cranes, uh, and bitterns and rails, those secretive marsh birds. So for this evening, please let's welcome Dr. Laura Kearns and I will stop my share and Dr. Kearns will bring her slide presentation up. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, looking forward to chatting with you all this evening. Um, just make, wanna make sure, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, my lighting is a little funky here. Hopefully it's good enough, but you'll be looking at my slides most of the time anyhow. So, um, all right. So uh, yeah, Nancy, you were mostly correct on all of those things. Um, it actually, I'm I'm now uh, past my eight year mark with the division. So, um, so yeah, but still working with the same groups of birds and so on. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen then and pull up my presentation and go ahead and start. So make everybody can see those slides okay, I hope. Okay, great. All right. So as uh, Nancy said, I'm gonna be talking about uh, tracking trumpeter swans here in the state. And um, I've been working with the trumpeter swans for over eight years now. And um, so uh, one of the um, things that are, I don't know, swans are important for every, you know, to everyone, or they have a lot of cultural significance um, in many cultures. Uh, you know, they're beautiful, they have a lot of grace. Um, and so they're, um, you know, I don't know, I grew up reading The Ugly Duckling. Um, that was an important book, you know, talking about the transformation of the ugly duckling into the beautiful swan. Um, in India, there is a, um, uh, a deity which is based on the swan um, in Greek mythology. Um, swans are also part of the whole mythology of the Greek gods and goddesses. So yeah, a lot of cultural significance for different um, cultures. Uh, but another reason they're special is um, they are the largest waterfowl species in North America, as well as Ohio. And um, and the other, just getting into kind of the focus of the talk is just uh, in terms of wildlife conservation, they are one of those uh, conservation success stories and they've made a tremendous recovery in North America and uh, as well as Ohio. So, um, so today I'm gonna just do a quick overview of um, some basic swan identification tips and talk about their life history. Um, talk about the trumpeter swan reintroduction here in Ohio, uh, discuss, um, give you an update on their current population status here in the state, and then finally talk about a movement ecology study that we've been participating in, um, and that's where the tracking of the trumpeter swans come in. So uh, just talk briefly about some identification tips. So the, um, so tonight's talk is about the trumpeter swan, but uh, there are actually three different swan species that you can see here in the state of Ohio. Um, the trumpeter swan is uh, <clears throat> originally native to Ohio and North America and have been reintroduced. Um, however, there's a non-native species of swan that can also be found here that's known as the mute swan, but they're very easy to tell apart. Um, the mute swan has an orange bill, the trumpeter swan has a black bill. Um, both of these uh, are, are breeders here in the state of Ohio. The mute swans really only started, um, they kind of escaped from captivity. They were brought here to be on people's ponds. They escaped from captivity and, um, well, I don't know if they escaped, but they, they kind of started to get out and about and reproduce in the wild. Um, and uh, that started to become a problem, um, but uh, but so their numbers have been reduced, but there's still some some in different parts of the state. Um, and then the third swan is the tundra swan, which looks similar to the trumpeter swan. It's another native species, but they're only found here um, in the winter time. They uh, breed up in the tundra, hence the name. 
Um, but uh, Ohio has become important for both migration passage, but um, more recently with the warming temperatures, um, they're tending to um, stay here in winter as well. Uh, so the trumpeter swan and the tundra swan are very similar looking. The trumpeter swan is actually bigger, um, but there's a couple um, key, some key features. If you have, this is something that may be difficult to see in the field unless you have a spotting scope, but the tundra swan has like a little teardrop shape, yellowish looking right around the, um, the eye. Um, and then if I go to my next slide here, you won't, so this is a trumpeter swan. There's no yellow around the eye. It's all black. Um, and then one characteristic that can be useful for telling the trumpeters and the tundras apart are the shape of, your, if you're looking at the swan straight on, as you, in this second picture down here in the bottom, you can see the trumpeter swan has like a V shape where um, the forehead feathers come down to the bill. Whereas on a tundra swan, it'll be more of a U shape. So that's uh, another um, diagnostic. Um, if they're right next to each other, you can see the size difference. However, when you're just looking at a flock of swans in a field or something, it can be a little more challenging to tell them apart. But those are some, some more fine uh, uh, details you can look for. So, uh, yeah, so like I said before, um, trumpeter swans are America's largest waterfowl, and uh, males average 24 to 26 pounds, but can get over that, over 30 pounds. Um, the females are a little bit smaller, uh, more like 20 to 22 pounds, uh, so a little bit smaller, but it can be hard to tell, it's, it's not enough of a size difference to tell a male from a female. Um, overall, their wingspan is six feet. So it's a pretty impressive wingspan. Their overall body length is four and a half feet. So still, still large, just their whole body length. Um, lifespan, uh, the maximum is uh, 25 to 29 years. Um, Average uh, depends on how old the bird is. Younger birds, um, within the first three years, it's about a 50% mortality rate. So, um, but once they get past that that third year and have kind of settled down on a breeding territory, um, they they tend to to live for quite a while once they've achieved that that year. So um, the herbivores, uh, they mainly eat seeds and vegetation, especially aquatic vegetation. And uh, so they're a wetland dependent species, um, but they will live on other bodies of water, um, particularly during the non-breeding season. But during the breeding season, they do like the wetland habitat for breeding. And per, um, there's vegetation where they can um, sometimes hide their young. Um, they, they like to build nests on muskrat mounds, so that's a, a, a good uh, feature of wetland habitats to have muskrats leaving mounds behind. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, on to talking about the trumpeter swan reintroduction. So there were, um, so just a little history about the trumpeter swan um, in Ohio and North America. So, they were one of, one of the species that was extirpated fairly early from Ohio um, uh, when European settlers came to North America. So yeah, pretty much by the early 1700s, they were completely gone from the state. And then this kind of continued throughout North America and there was a real low point in the 1930s when fewer than a hundred swans were um, known in the lower 48 states. Um, however, they rediscovered uh, the Alaskan trumpeters. And um, from that point, there was, uh, and with uh, protections of laws like a Migratory Bird Treaty Act and uh, some other uh, wildlife friendly uh, policies, they started to make a slow comeback. And then um, here in the Midwest, um, Several states started to do reintroductions starting in the 60s um, in Minnesota, and then it kind of spread from there. And then Ohio decided to do a reintroduction in the mid 90s. 
Um, so that reintroduction was active from 1996 to 2003. And then um, they achieved, the, the state achieved its uh, reintroduction goals in 2003. And then since that time, uh, basically we've been monitoring the ongoing population growth and um, there's been, you know, increased protection and restoration of wetlands. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, the mute swan earlier, um, that was, uh, that's been a species that we've been trying to keep under control um, because they directly compete with trumpeter swans for habitat. So, um, so the reintroduction, um, there were kind of two um, approaches that they were taking and that involved, um, you know, there's a lot of trumpeter swans that had been bred and, and raised in captivity. Um, so they were uh, releasing ones which had, which were older than two years. And then they also, and, and the Cleveland Zoo was very active in helping with that reintroduction effort. And then there was also uh, swans that were captive reared from eggs from the wild Alaskan population. Uh, and so that was a technique that was used for a lot of the different re repopulation, reintroduction of um, swan populations in the Midwest. And so uh, <clears throat> the, the swans are reintroduced to several locations throughout the state. Most of them were on public land, um, uh, various wildlife areas in Northwest Ohio, Northeast Ohio, and then a couple locations in more inland Ohio, like Kildare Plains, um, Kilbuck Marsh, and the, um, the wilds. Um, the wilds was technically private land, but owned by the Columbus Zoo, but they've been a great uh, conservation partner. Um, Winus Point Marsh Conservancy is another private land. Winus Point is originally a, a shooting club, still is, um, but um, also is a marsh conservancy and uh, is very actively working to um, keep their wetlands um, functioning uh, as really high quality wetlands. Uh, so anyway, those swans were reintroduced um, in different spots around the, the state. And you can kind of see the, the slow increase in the population um, during that time. Uh, so yeah, really started at zero and um, very slowly built up the breeding the number of breeding pairs. And then, uh, you know, really only took a couple years for them to start reproducing on their own in the wild. And um, by the late, or by uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, they were getting some consistent reproduction. And so between um, having about 20 breeding pairs in the state and getting some consistent reproduction, they decided they would hold off on reintroducing anymore and just see what the population would do on its own. So, um, so now I'm going to move into the current population status. And uh, here today, this is uh, the most recent um, uh, uh, graph with um, results from 1997 all the way until our summer survey from the summer in 2022. Uh, so yeah, it's been, uh, they've just continued to grow. There's been some, you know, some ups and downs, but uh, overall, they just, they just keep continuing to grow and expand throughout the state. Uh, <clears throat> so this past survey, this past summer, uh, we counted 247 signets. So the red line here are the signets. Um, 129 pairs, so that's the number of breeding pairs in the state. And then uh, I don't have a, a line on the graph, but we counted 339 non-breeding adults this year, which I, again, that number, it just seems like every year we're gaining like another hundred swans. So, um, so again, the total swan population for this year was 843 based on uh, combining all of those. So um, yeah, so, so anyway, the swans have been doing great. Um, and just uh, so a little, if you're a stats nerd like me and you like to look at these numbers, um, so 2022, our pair growth rate was 16.2%, uh, um, uh, signets per pair, 1.91, 1 
and non-breeders, like I said, 339. Uh, just to compare those with recent um, recent trends, uh, the five-year average has been 11.5% for the pair growth rate, um, but since 2003, it's been 14.3. So we're we're chugging along right there at 16%. Uh, the number of signets per pair um, this year was a little bit lower. Um, uh, below both the five-year average and the, the um, average since 2003. Um, you know, there uh, it's sometimes it's hard to say for sure, like what's driving that. Um, could be just kind of funny weather patterns, but um, one concern has been avian flu. Um, we haven't documented or, or actually, we haven't confirmed avian flu on in any trumpeter swans here in the state, but it was confirmed in other trumpeter swans in other states this year. So um, that could have been a factor in uh, breeding this, this year. Um, but like I said earlier, we still have a pretty robust population with you know 339 non-breeders. So that's, that's well above a five-year average. So again, strong, strong population here in the state at this point. Um, and then just to show the expansion of the population. Uh, so those yellow stars right, are, um, sit in those approximate locations of where the reintroductions occurred. And uh, the, the counties in black up there in Northwest Ohio, those are uh, Swan heaven up there. There are lots of swans up there. If you want to go somewhere to see a trumpeter swan, go up there. You will see a trumpeter swan. Uh, and then the lighter gray colors are um, where we're seeing, you know, a handful of breeding trumpeter swans in those counties. A um, little bit harder to find, but they're they're there. And those light gray counties, they just continue to expand out and increase. Um, the number of counties where you can find breeding pairs. So um, slowly expanding and growing throughout the state. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into uh, the recent study that we've been working on and uh, talk about some of our, our adventures in tracking trumpeter swans and some of the early results. Uh, so this all came about uh, the University of Minnesota decided to, to do a trumpeter swan study a few years ago. Uh, Minnesota is a little bit different from uh, the other states in the Midwest. They have um, are around 30,000 trumpeter swans. <laughs> and so um, they're really trying to figure out the best approaches for managing them. And um, so there are a lot of questions still about the population and, you know, how healthy is it? Um, uh, and, and also what's the migration potential? And um, I know a lot of times people were asking me, so where do Ohio's trumpeter swans go during the winter? And I was like, well, you know, we don't really know because uh, we didn't have, we hadn't put any kind of uh, marker on our birds since the reintroduction process. And uh, we really weren't sure what they were doing in the winter and um, same questions for, for the rest of the uh, Midwest. So, um, so anyway, these uh, researchers from the University of Minnesota decided to pursue some questions related to migration and the population as a whole. And they um, managed to convince a whole bunch of other states to, to join in the fun um, <laughs> or the study. So, um, so I just want to talk a little bit uh, just to give you the North American perspective on trumpeter swan populations. And um, there are three main populations. Um, the Midwestern swans are uh, known as the interior population. So Ohio swans are part of that population. In the middle of the country, we have the Rocky Mountain population. And then on the far west coast, we have the Pacific Coast population. And so this is a map here from uh, based on eBird data, and uh, it's showing where the swans are at different times of year. Um, not that you need to know all those details, but it just gives you a, a good overview of uh, kind of the hot spots for swans and, and shows you that demarcation and where the interior population is primarily found. 
So, so again, we're focusing on the population, Minnesota, uh, Iowa, Missouri, and east to Ohio, Michigan, um, and Ontario. So, all right. So the objectives of this study, um, the first objective is to understand movements and migratory behaviors and habitat use of swans. Um, so a lot, there's a lot of information you can get from um, tracking swans to different locations. So that's that's one of the major goals of the study. Um, another opportunity, they thought, you know, we're going to have these birds in hand. Um, so let's um, look at some other issues that have been a, a, of concern for the swan populations. And one of those is lead poisoning. Um, lead poisoning can lead to the death of swans and cause other um, kind of maladaptive behaviors. So one question was, you know, how prevalent is lead poisoning throughout the population? And two, does it have any impact on movement behaviors? And then third is to determine genetic diversity of the interior population. You know, is there enough uh, genetic diversity to help, you know, that we expect the population to continue to persist over time? Um, you know, there were some concerns because there were, um, uh, you know, limited population in the captive pool at the time and limited population from the wild, um, you know, is, is that something that could be a limiting factor down the road? And so finally, um, the, the study can provide a lot of information. Again, I mentioned management, like Minnesota has a large population, but Ohio does not. And then we have kind of everything in between in the other states. Um, how many of those swans are moving and migrating? Um, what are, you know, what should states to the south expect? Um, so the, um, the Mississippi Flyway is in the process of um, revising the interior population trumpeter swan management plan. Um, also here in Ohio, we need to revise our management plan. And so um, those are things that we're hoping that the results from this study will be able to help fuel some improved revisions to those plans. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, kind of the methods of the uh, project. So these trumpeter swans, um, <clears throat> in the past, there's kind of a couple different methods that have been used to mark swans. So you can just observe them and identify individuals and in the, um, one of those primary marking devices have been net collars. And so for this study, they developed, or a company in Europe actually developed a GPS GSM collar um, or transmitter collar. So there's a device um, inserted in these collars uh, that uh, takes uh, GPS fixes, global positioning system fixes. So we can get locations, pretty precise locations. And then the GSM part is that it's transmitted over the cellular network. So whenever these callers come in proximity of a um, cell phone tower, data gets uploaded and um, then you can see where the swan has been. Um, they're also uh, solar powered. So um, in this photograph here, the black indicates the solar panel on the collars, so that helps keep the, the collars um, functioning over time. So, and they're they're made out of a lightweight plastic, so very lightweight. Um, like they, they they barely to me like when I was holding them, they barely felt like they weighed anything. So so very lightweight. Um, so another important aspect of of um, this project was what time of year to try and capture the swans to put the collars on them. And that's a little bit tricky because like I said, they are a big bird. <laughs> um, so so uh, just you know, quick view of the annual cycle of a trumpeter swan in um, between winter and spring, they're migrating, um, going to their, uh, their breeding areas. That's called the pre-breeding migration. And then between spring and summer, they're on territory, they're breeding. And between summer and autumn, 
uh, at that point, you know, their cygnets have hatched, they're um, a little more independent. And so the swan, adult swans at that point go through a post-breeding molt. And during that time, they lose their primary flight feathers. So they cannot fly for about a month. Um, and so this was uh, important for reasons I'll say in a minute. And then autumn to winter, they migrate um, as needed. But that post-breeding molt is really important. When they can't fly, that's the ideal time for a researcher to catch a swan. So um, again, just to illustrate what that molt looks like, if you if you have a bird in hand, um, so the, the the old flight feathers fall out, and you get these um, these blood feathers basically growing in. And that feather, as it grows in, there's a blood vessel that's supplying nutrients to the feather. And then as the feather starts to unfurl from its sheath, that blood feather or that blood vessel retracts and then eventually you get your complete feather produced but during that time um, it's a very you know, going through molt takes a lot of energy for the birds um, and they don't have the aerodynamics the the lift that they would normally get from their feathers um, is not there so they can't they can't fly uh, and so that is an easier time for a researcher to try and capture a trumpeter swan. And um, the method we used was basically chasing them in a boat and just capturing them as fast as we could. Um, so when they can't fly, that makes that process or procedure a lot easier for obvious reasons, I hope. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we, uh, we were able to get 20 callers out on swans here in Ohio. And so this uh, geographic, it shows the geographic extent and layout of where we captured swans. So up in Northwest Ohio, um, we captured eight swans. Um, then in sort of uh, Central Ohio there, like uh, Marion, Wyandotte, Delaware counties, we caught six swans. Um, we got two in like the, um, between uh, uh, Medina County and uh, Summit County, and then we caught an additional four, four birds up at uh, Mosquito uh, Creek Wildlife Area and Grand River Wildlife Area. And so that gave us a pretty good distribution of where um, where the majority and kind of the concentrations of our swans are and covered more or less most of those places where we had originally reintroduced birds. And uh, I just want to put a shout out to the zoos here in Ohio. Um, we, when this project came up, uh, the division hadn't budgeted for this project, and we were kind of having, um, which is one of those times when we just we just didn't have a lot of money. And so our zoos here in Ohio chipped in um, and provided some additional funding to purchase collars, um, especially Cleveland Metro Park Zoo was big. Um, uh, fundraiser for us and also the um, Toledo Zoo. Um, so they really helped a lot. And then we had um, some zoo um, staff came out and helped us catch the swans as well. So, um, so that was a great help as well. And then the last thing I want to mention down at the bottom of the page here, you see a website and you can actually go onto this website. It's um, open to the public. You can go in and view all of these locations where we've tracked swans here in the state. And uh, you can change the background of the map too. So you can see you know, in more detail if it's uh, what kind of habitat they were in um, and that sort of thing. So it's really kind of a fun thing to check out if you're interested in sort of swan movements and life history. Um, and you can look at you know, swans all over the whole study area. So, uh, so it's a pretty neat. Uh, neat uh, piece of information that you can look at as well. Okay, so um, once we captured the swans, um, so we uh, took blood from the swan and we did that um, in one of the leg veins. Um, and that is how we uh, got information for the lead, amount of lead in the swans, and then um, also for the genetic testing. 
And then we also took some other morphometric measurements um, and sexed the birds. Um, the only way to tell the difference between a male and female is to look at the cloacal vent. And there are some differences in the morphology there that help you tell the difference between a male and a female. But we also took these morphometric measurements just because we had the bird in hand and it was just interesting to see how much variation there could be, um, especially between sexes and ages and things like that. And so uh, once we did all that, uh, and after we put the collar on, we let the bird go and they'd, they'd swim off. Um, and so uh, then we kind of got the fun part. I mean, in terms of uh, the hard work, that was all we had to do. <laughs> it wasn't just all we had to do, but that the kind of from that point on, we then can follow the birds um, online and see where they go. So, um, so yeah, so I'm going to show some maps now, kind of do, showing some summaries of movements um, from the first year of the project. And uh, so the thing I want to point out here, these are birds that were captured in Minnesota, and they uh, did some pretty interesting migration movements um, that first year. A lot of them headed um, all the way down into Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois, and uh, then um, same thing for some of the birds from Wisconsin, some of the birds from uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. But then you get to our Ohio birds and they pretty much stayed put. They did not go anywhere really <laughs> compared to everybody else. So that was, uh, that was a huge uh, finding for us, just confirming, okay, we these birds pretty much stay here year round. And uh, so <clears throat> they were trying to figure out, you know, what were some possible explanations for this? And uh, basically what it seems to boil down to is that it is a latitudinal difference. So this graph here is a summary of the birds that migrated in the um, fall winter of 2020. And the bottom line here shows the latitude of capture location. So as you go left to right, 51, that was your more northern um, capture sites. And then all the way down to 41 and 40, those are the locations here in Ohio. And then the y-axis here is distance from capture site to the furthest southern location. So those birds that were captured at more northern sites were the ones that migrated the furthest. And then uh, the ones at the lower latitudes had the the uh, the shortest migrate, you know, shortest little to none in the, in terms of migration distance. So um, so that is is basically the conclusion is that it's it's really a latitudinal difference. And along with that, you know, warmer temperatures, there's not the need to migrate as much at these um, lower latitudes. So um, just to summarize the some of the primary locations where we were um, capturing birds, um, yeah, I just think it's interesting to look at some of these movement patterns a little more closely. Um, so despite that in comparison to uh, the Minnesota and Wisconsin birds, um, it was really, um, we still had a little bit of movement from the, um, from, from our birds, um, especially during winter when we had those, um, you know, we've had relatively mild winters the last two, but um, we did have some periods where, you know, it did not get above freezing for a few weeks. And so during those times, we did see some sort of micro movements of swans. So particularly, um, so this area is looking at Upper Sandusky, Ohio, um, where the bulk of these birds are is Kilder Plains Wildlife Area and then Big Island Wildlife Area. And those birds, for the most part, they hung out in those areas during the winter. Even when it iced over, they would they would stay there. But when it got really cold and, and more of a deep freeze, then they started to migrate south a little bit. And um, there's this particular quarry down in um, southern Delaware County, close to Columbus, where they they just like to go and hang out. 
Um, and then that during the day, they go out and uh, feed on waste grain and the farm fields in that area and, um, you know, get through those really harsh periods of winter that way. So that was interesting to see those, um, those short, short distance migrations down in that part of the state. Um, up in the Northwest, up in, uh, uh, so again, this is Lucas County, Ottawa County, Sandusky County. These are the coastal Lake Erie marshes. Um, they really seem, they, they are happy there. <laughs> they do not seem to move um, out of those areas a whole lot if they can help it. Um, it's, you know, they've got great wetland habitat up there. There's also a lot of fields, a lot of um, opportunities to feed on waste grain. So yeah, not a lot of movements anywhere else during that time. Um, more here in Northeast Ohio. So the couple that we um, tagged, um, there's a bird we tagged um, in the Akron area. And unfortunately that one didn't really, um, it either went offline, the collar mount functioned or it perished um, within a couple months of us catching it. So just some little movements between Medina and Summit counties, but we weren't able to observe any um, winter movements with it. But the other bird that we caught, um, this was uh, Medina, um, Kilbuck Lakes, uh, Medina County uh, Metro Park. Um, that bird moved around quite a bit and ended up spending a good part of the winter down at Kilbuck Wildlife Area and Funk Bottoms Wildlife Area. So that was interesting to see that movement. Um, and she uh, was a female. She unfortunately passed away in um, the spring, like late May, early June. And um, she was confirmed as, as dying, but we don't know what, um, what, what of. Uh, we weren't able to recover her body. Um, so we're not real sure what happened, but um, it was about the time avian flu was coming through. So um, that's one possibility is that maybe she succumbed to the avian flu. But still, interesting movement patterns um, uh, throughout that part of Ohio. And then in Northeast Ohio, uh, the, the handful that we um, tagged up there, again, uh, I was kind of, I didn't know, I was kind of curious to see what those Northeastern swans would do because, you know, they get a lot more snow up there and, um, uh, but they also kind of sat pretty tight through the winter and stayed in that area. It wasn't until the spring that we got um, a couple dispersal movements. Um, one of those birds ended up going into um, Northwest Pennsylvania. So, um, so um, basically up until this point, uh, like I said, we captured and tagged or collared 20 different individual swans. And this is the breakdown of um, whether they were uh, male or female, whether they were breeders or non-breeders. And um, for whatever reason, we, we captured a lot more females than males and um, uh, slightly more breeders than non-breeders. And um, up until this point, uh, we're pretty sure that 10 of those birds is still alive. So 50%, uh, well, we know, we know for sure that they're alive. So about 50% at this point. Uh, we can confirm that six of those have died and causes of death have included um, collisions. Uh, we lost one to a power line collision, one to a vehicle collision. Um, one unfortunately got fishing line wrapped around its beak and um, it appeared to have not been able to feed um, and died. So that was, that was a uh, sad, um, tra I mean, they're all sad and tragic, but that one in particular. Um, and then, like I said, avian flu may have been an impact this past spring. Um, so, uh, so then, so there's that. Um, and then in terms of dispersal, we had a couple that um, did, um, you know, it wasn't a winter migration. It wasn't a migration in that respect, but it was a dispersal that they they went uh, out of Ohio 
And so the one I mentioned went into Northwest Pennsylvania. So not really that far away, but another one, um, it went all the way up into uh, the Southwest part of Ontario, which is just North of Minnesota. So pretty long uh, flight. Um, we've, we've known of a couple other birds from Ohio doing that. Um, and then it went off, it went off the cellular network. So we're not real sure like if it's still alive or um, we're kind of hoping that it'll come back online this winter, um, that it'll migrate south from there. So we're kind of kind of waiting to see what happens there. Um, and then we have a couple birds that we're not real sure what happened. Uh, the collar stopped working. They, it wasn't, they didn't put out a mortality signal. So it could just be the collar malfunctioned. Um, and so sometimes those will pop back on. Again, they might've gone... I don't know, out of range or something, or they're in a place where the, for whatever reason, the cell phone tower can't pick up the signal. Um, so, so it remains to be seen if we get any more information out of those or not. Um, another thing I want to mention, you know, we were, you know, we were kind of looking to see if our birds moved out of the state. Um, and, and we were kind of hoping to see some move into the state as well. Um, so through some other tracking means, um, occasionally we'll get birds come into the state from other areas. So like this bird here, this um, you can see the yellow tag on the one swan there, and that's um, got a marker on it, R63. And that showed up in Finley, Ohio in February of 2021. And that bird is from Ontario from a study they're doing up there. But for this project, so far, the only bird that we've tracked to Ohio um, has been from Wisconsin. And that bird um, wintered over in Grand Lake St. Mary's this past winter. Um, so that was pretty interesting to see that bird coming and uh, spending some time over there this winter. Um, the other thing I'll just mention, just some of the preliminary results from the lead testing, um, because this is a big concern. Uh, the, these are uh, 90 of the birds that were tested from lead, and this included about 12 of Ohio's swans. And so what this shows is um, parts per billion, um, and, uh, and the x-axis doesn't really mean anything. It's just representing a different individual, but showing um, uh, the different individuals and, and just ranked in order of how much lead was found in their um, systems when the blood was taken. And the blue line represents kind of the level over which you can have sublethal um, impacts from lead. So that's where you can get influences on behavior. Um, the red line represents the lethal limit. So anything over that can mean that uh, uh, the bird is is in the process of dying or likely to die soon from the lead contamination in its body. So fortunately, you know, there's a few couple swans above that that kind of lethal limit. There are a few above that sublethal limit, but for the most part, they are under that that sublethal line. And um, all of Ohio swans were well underneath that sublethal line as well. So. Um, so basically, we're able to come to some preliminary conclusions that lead should not be a big influence on any of the migratory or movement behaviors that we're seeing, um, at least here in Ohio's swans. So, um, so yeah, this prog this study is still in progress, and we're still you know watching birds and. Um, waiting on the genetic analyses. Uh, so there's some, you know, a lot of the um, sort of final results from the study are yet to be determined, but, um, but so far, um, you know, first of all, we know our swans are continuing to do pretty well here in Ohio. And then, you know, the big take home at the moment is just confirming that Ohio's trumpeters tend to stay in the state for the winter. And so, you know, that really means that we as, um, as a state agency, as a state have responsibility for those, those swans that we see breeding here. Um, and then another positive is that lead does not seem to be a big problem. Um, 
but from some of those mortalities that we've seen, um, it's it's clear that there are some other anthropogenic factors that are still a concern, power line collisions, vehicle collisions, fishing line, like those are things that we can, um, there are things that we can do to try and minimize that education, um, work on signage about, you know, cleaning up your fishing line, um, slowing down in certain areas where there's a lot of wildlife. Um, so some things like that, that would be good to, uh, to work on. So, uh, <clears throat> so if you're, um, out and about and you ever see a swan with a collar or a tag on it or anything like that, um, especially some of these um, call or some of these birds that the callers have stopped working. Um, we know some of them are still out there and it, and, and some, and sometimes we get a report uh, on it and it's like, oh, the caller's not working, but we know they're still alive. So, so that's really, really helpful to us. And so you can report that and there's a couple different ways. So the first is the Division of Wildlife does have a wildlife reporting website. So you can go on there and um, use this uh, to report uh, trumpeter swans, but also lots of other things as well. Um, probably most of you are familiar with eBird. That's another place where I go and look periodically and look at photos. And um, sometimes I find some of our swans in there. So that's pretty exciting. And then um, another organization you can work with is the Trumpeter Swan Society, who is a, a big participant in this project and helped fund uh, a lot of it. Um, they also are a great organization to um, you know, report sightings to. They're really interested. And um, whenever you report something to them, they automatically forward it on to me as well if it concerns an Ohio trumpeter. So, um, so that's another great great organization and great, um, great place for swan resources. So just um, thinking, you know, this, this would not have been possible without the assistance of lots of staff. Again, I mentioned the zoos earlier. Um, they were just great to work with. And um, uh, so lots of great folks helping out with this project. So um, with that, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions and um, go from there. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Nice round of applause. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Yeah. Um, let me just quickly go through the chat and pull up some questions. Um, some of them we can answer, uh, but I see you also uh, answered a lot of the questions that some folks had. Um, let me see. Um, oh, where are the birds ingesting the lead from? Where where are they getting the lead in their in their systems? From? Yeah. So the the lead. Uh, most of the swans, because they are eating uh, vegetation in wetlands and such. Um, Sometimes like the, uh, it can be from, uh, uh, from lead shot from waterfowl hunting. And um, yeah, I'm not sure how long um, here in Ohio, lead shot has been banned when you're waterfowl hunting, but, um, but that is banned here in Ohio. And then fishing uh, weights is another possibility. Those sink in the water and and there could be all kinds of legacy stuff in there too. So, so those are the two primary uh, sources. Yeah, and to clarify, swans will ingest hard little pebbles and rocks and stuff to help grind up grains and stuff in, in their gizzard. So, so that's where they, that's why they, they swallow those, those crunchy, lum yummy <laughs> lead pieces. Right. Yeah, yeah. not so yummy. Um, I do have a question. What was meant by uh, swan management? You know, mm -hmm. talking about managing swans in Ohio or Minnesota. Yeah, um, I would say the one of the big things is in Minnesota. Uh, in some places, uh, particularly in uh, the wild rice fields in northern Minnesota and I think northern Wisconsin, um, there are issues with the swans 
eating some of the wild rice crop. I mean, it's an aquatic plant, um, perfect swan food. And, and so there's, there's some conflict there. And so there, um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes they, they have to get a depredation permit. And so if they're doing that, uh, we want to have a good handle on the population, uh, the behaviors of the population so that that uh, those limits on those depredation permits are set at a reasonable level. Um, so that's that's one thing is managing the conflict aspects of it. Um, and then in terms of, uh, there's also some concerns about hunting. Um, pretty much all of us who have been involved with trumpeter spawn reintroductions um, are not in favor of hunting, but there certainly are um, parties out there who are interested in hunting. And I think part of it is to try and understand these movements um, so that um, we can make informed decisions about whether or not that would potentially happen down the line. Um, so that I don't think that would ever happen here in Ohio because um, our population is so small. And um, but but that is like looking at the bigger picture um, part of the concern. Um, I mean, on the flip side, uh, when the trumpeter swans were um, when the last management plan was made 20, 25 years ago, they were only anticipating like the population being up to like 5,000 individuals. And the population has blown that uh, objective or that uh, wished for population level out of the water. I mean, over 30,000 swans in the interior population. So they've far surpassed what anybody ever thought they would. Um, so, but and, but the flip side of that is you have some of those nuisance conflict issues in, in certain areas. But um, here in Ohio, we haven't, um, for the most part, uh, haven't heard of any major issues in terms of like nuisance issues. Um, so that's good. I don't know if you want to stop share so we can see everybody who's been Sure. participating and yeah maybe, I just didn't didn't know if there were slides people wanted to go back to but um but I can um, yeah so they can unmute and and ask a question that I think we are our population here is small enough that we can yeah so if you want to unmute and if you have a question that you'd like to ask I have one. Oh, I see Susan hand is up hey everybody I'm new to the group it's nice to see faces um mm -hmm. So I was curious about the number of signets you said per pair. It was like 1.91. Mm -hmm. Is that the number that survived? Because I'm only familiar with a few pairs of trumpeter swans, but they've had, you know, 10 and usually like six fledge or seven survive. So the number just seemed low. Yeah. So that's the average number per pair. Um, when we're flying, we so we fly the survey in July. And so at that point, we are um, getting a mix of ages and fledges, but we're taking a snapshot in time of how many young they have with them at that point. And we get um, we get a variety of zero to nine signets per pair. So you get you get a wide range of variation in that number, but that is the average number per pair. So that includes pairs that when we see them do not have any young and we we assume that a pair is when you see two individuals together because they do have a strong pair bond um that's um yeah that's kind of our unit of measure so, so there could be some you know that's an assumption there could be some that are just hanging out but they didn't maybe they didn't breed or they're just hanging out in a group of two um so there could be you know so that's an assumption we're making, but um, but for the most part, these are in areas where um, there's been consistent breeding over time. So it's kind of a, you know, I think it's a reasonable assumption. 
yeah, Susan, which which uh, swan pairs are you familiar with? Well, mostly the ones at Sandy Ridge over here in Lorraine. Mm -hmm. those the ones. Yeah, those um, I know have been having pretty big uh, groups the last few years. So that's they're superstars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Bath Nature Preserve is another pair that, and mm. we have people watching them for well years now and photographing them. And like one of the first years they nested, uh, they didn't do very well in raising their young. The second year they did a little bit better. So yeah. I think they they start learning. <laughs> the absolutely, absolutely. That's a really common trend that we see. Um, you know, first year nothing second year maybe a couple and then uh there's just some pairs that then really do great <laughs> after a couple years what accounts for uh how so many uh trumpeter swans in uh, minnesota yeah um well i think part of it is they were the one of the first states to do a reintroduction they started back in the 60s so they've got you know 30 more years than we do um second of all is they have a lot of great wetland habitat in minnesota like what is it land of Ten Thousand lakes i think is the state's theme um unfortunately here in ohio we're one of the worst states in terms of our wetland uh heritage we we drained and converted over 90% of our wetlands. So that's something that we're continually trying to right that wrong. Um, and I think that's also been, you know, I think in the last 10 to 20 years, I think it's really tried to invest and protect existing wetlands and try to get wetlands back on the ground. And definitely if we didn't have the habitat, we wouldn't be seeing the, the increases that, that we are. So that's still really key key part of the success. Oh, I see a, a question. How do you tell breeding from non-breeding swans? Yeah, again, um, yeah, from like we do this survey is an aerial survey. And so again, we're kind of, um, we're kind of guessing sometimes where you have like a group of two or three birds hanging up together, but um, most of the time we'll see these huge flocks. So up at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge in Northwest Ohio, we will see a huge flock of over a hundred birds hanging out together. And uh, they're, they're clearly not breeding <laughs> anymore. And we've seen similar kind of flocks over at Mosquito um, Creek Wildlife Area. Um, we had a flock of like 40 to 50 over there. And then um then lately we've been seeing some smaller groups pop up in different areas like a group of 20 or 30 so it's we're kind of um you know any group that's clearly not a pair or have young with them and are kind of flocked together we're calling those non-breeders and i guess maybe one final question so you would still like to have um information about pairs of birds um, nesting and if any collared birds you, you want the, the some sightings to be sent in is that right yeah yeah I would say the the big thing is um is the collared birds at this point um eBird honestly people are great at reporting things on eBird and I do go to eBird to kind of confirm or look for new places to look for swans when we're doing our survey um, so that's been great. Um, so it's not, not so important, but, um, at this point, if you see any of those collared birds, um, that, that would be great. And, and confirming if those, those birds that have collars have young with them or not, um, because that's hard, um, information, you know, we can't get that information from the, the GPS movements. And, and like I said, since some of those GPS transmitters are, starting to wear out and we can't follow them anymore. If we can confirm that they're still alive um, on the ground, that's really helpful. Um, see a question, a pair with four signets in Michigan by a very small pond on a golf course, would they run on the fairway to lift off to fly? Uh, 
possibly, but they can also run on the water and lift off from the water as well. Um, it does seem like um, we've got a few different locations here in the state where, where we have swans breeding on golf courses. Um, so that <laughs> seems to be a place that they're adapting to and doing all right. So, um, so yeah, they, they could run on the fairway or if there's a decent stretch of water, they can, they can run on that as well. And what's the link for reporting uh, either collared birds, uh, things that you've? Yeah, let me um, see if go I go back can to that slide. That in the chat. Hold on a second. Let me get out of my slideshow. So for Division of Wildlife, that one in first. Yeah, that's for a wildlife um, species sighting page. Um, and then if you, if you, you know, eBird, you can report on eBird or um, Trumpeter Swan Society, probably just easiest to Google Trumpeter Swan Society and it'll pop up there. Wonderful. And there's all sorts of other things you can report on that Division of Wildlife page. We have a list of things that we're interested in, in tracking, so. All righty. Well, I thank everybody for joining us this evening. Laura, thank you so much for the information. It'll make us look at trumpeter swans a little differently now. We always mm -hmm. think, oh, how beautiful they are, but now we're gonna look for neck bands and count mm -hmm. the signets and all that other stuff too. Yeah. Hopefully they'll start nesting in the Cuyahoga Valley. I don't know. They've been, they've been exploring some of the wetlands there. Yeah, yeah. I've heard some, uh, some potential reports down that way. So yeah, that'd be great. All righty. Everyone have a great evening and thank you again. Um, great fall. And hopefully you can join us with the book club and on some of our bird walks and, of course, next month's program. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.